So welcome back from the break. Hopefully you took an opportunity to perhaps step away, take a drink, um, stretch your legs, whatever you felt was necessary. But now let's take a look at the concept check question again and get an answer. So what hypothesis did Miller test in his classic experiment? The actual working hypothesis that Miller had was um, based on the hypothesis of Oprin and Haldane that was proposed in 1921. And remember that hypothesis was that the chemical conditions present on the primordial earth were such that they favored the formation of the precursor organic molecules for life from, organ from inorganic molecules. So that's basically the hypothesis that um, Miller was testing when he put together his device um, and let it run to see if anything could be produced under those conditions. So let's move on and take a look at this next section of the chapter. So in this next section, we're going to take a quick look at the fossil record. We're not going to spend a lot of time with this because as I said at the beginning, when I opened the, the presentation, we've already done the paleontology lab and we've talked a lot about the fossil record there and you've, you've had some time to think about it. So we really don't need to go into a whole lot of detail about the fossil record, but let's just remind ourselves of why the fossil record is so important. So remember again, fossils are any sort of remnant or indication of a pre-existing organism. So it could be footprints, it could be organic matter, frozen or desiccated, it could be, um, oh, now I've, I've forgotten the term now. Uh, it could be mineralized, so um, it could be mineralized wood, it could be mineralized bone. Um, in some cases, um, we, have, we even now recognize that in fossilized dinosaur bones, so that's going back um, tens of millions of years at least, perhaps even further back, it's possible to preserve some of the soft tissue and extract organic molecules out of that soft tissue. This is something that for a long time was considered to be really, really controversial when the first research team um, published their results saying that they were able to do this. Most people said, no, 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 no. And in fact, a number of leaders in paleontology basically said, I don't care what evidence you provide, I will never believe that you can do this. Well, now we know that you actually can. And you can actually extract, not DNA, unfortunately, but you can extract um, small um, pieces of protein from this soft tissue. So there is a wide range of material that, that needs to be considered when you talk in terms of fossils. The one thing that we do need to remember is that for all of the fossils that we do have, we have a very, 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 very small representation of the great diversity of life forms that have existed over the um, period of time that life has existed on Earth, approximately 4 billion years. Um, and what we uh, and just to to make clear what what that's why that is what we have to remember, it is estimated that ninety nine percent, maybe more than ninety nine percent of all the species that have ever lived on the planet are only known from the fossil record. They're extinct. Um, and remember, the fossil record doesn't even give us access to most of them, it just gives us a small crack of a window onto the great diversity of life forms that have existed on the earth. That being said, the fossil record still allows us to build a story about the nature of life, its origin and how it has evolved over time. So we know that life begins in a very primitive form, um, earliest form of life that we find in the fossils of these organisms called or these structures called stromatolites they're formed by cyanobacteria so you may recall that cyanobacteria are photosynthetic bacteria these are also the ancestors to chloroplasts a little bit more on that um, a little bit later in this in this chapter but um, modern day stromatolite uh, cyanobacteria that 
form stromatolites form these structures that are layers of sediments overlaying layers of cells. So the cells being photosynthetic need to have access to light. When the sediment lays down on top of them and blocks light, they grow up through the sediment to create another layer of living cells. And so you have the alternating layers of sediment and cellular material in the fossils, which tells us that these are fossilized stromatolites because that's the exact same structure that you see in the um, extant stromatolites. And this photograph is actually a photograph of stromatolites in a region called Shark Bay on the northwest coast of Western Australia. I've had the good fortune to actually visit this area. I can tell you that these, what the, these are exactly what the stromatolites look like. And also I visited some areas where there are fossilized stromatolites in reef-like structures. And I can tell you that this is what they look like in cross-section. Um, I've seen them in museums. I've seen them in um, the landscape. And this is exactly what they look like. And these represent some of the very earliest fossils that we have. In fact, the oldest fossil currently absolutely dated dates to 3.48 billion years ago, and it is a cyanobacterial fossil. Then around 1500 million, uh, million years ago, about 1.5 billion years ago, we start to see evidence of fossils that are of a different type. I'll, I'll put it that way. They resemble eukaryotic cells or the beginnings of eukaryotic cells. We know for sure that around a billion years ago, eukaryotic cells are firmly established. But there are some earlier fossils that are a little bit harder to interpret that show evidence that they are perhaps very early eukaryotic cells. And this is an example of one. Let me move the text box out of the way. So Tapania is one of these very, very early, potentially eukaryotic cellular um, eukaryotic cellular fossils. Uh, and it's unicellular for a large point of time, uh, for, for the next 500 million years or thereabouts. Then we start to see the emergence of multicellularity. Eventually, uh, and that multicellularity is seen both in um, precursors of animals and also in the precursors of plants. So we see, start to see multicellular algae, and we start to see evidence around 600 million years ago to 550 million years ago of organisms. And you've seen the replicas in the paleontology lab that I brought back from Australia. This is um, a photograph of the actual fossil. This is Dickinsonia costata, and you've seen the resin um, replica. Um, and it shows, as I pointed out in lab, a bilateral um, symmetry. There's the line running down the middle. Um, and we interpret this as a bilateral animal. Uh, that's our best interpretation. It's clearly not plant, so, and it's not fungus. So if it's not one of those two, it is almost certainly an animal. So we start to see the evidence of very, very early animals. And of, also you saw the the replica of the fossilized jellyfish um, that shows radial symmetry. So we have side by side, very early examples of animals showing both bilateral symmetry and radial symmetry. Then we see at the beginning of the Cambrian, which begins around 525 million years ago, um, the beginnings of what is referred to as the Cambrian explosion. Um, we'll touch on that a little bit when we look at some high points. This is the point in time where we see the rapid diversification of the animal kingdom. And the appearance in the fossil record of very early representatives of all the phyla that we identify today, some 35 to 36 phyla that represent the animal kingdom. We believe that all of those phyla emerged during this time period of around 20 million years from, so from around 525 million years ago, right at the beginning of the Cambrian, through to around 500 million years ago, roughly that time frame, this is the period where we see the emergence of the animal kingdom 
in terms of the phyla, at least, as we would recognize it today. Of course, some of the phyla um, predate that, and we'll touch on that as well when we talk about the Cambrian explosion. There's evidence, particularly molecular clock evidence, that suggests that some of the phyla, perhaps all of the phyla, or at least many of the major phyla, had um, already started to diversify, but only in a limited um, fashion in the Ediacaran prior to the Cambrian. But in the Cambrian, um, the ecological conditions favored great um, diversification or rapid diversification, um, giving rise to those phyla that were not already pre-existing, but also in all the phyla, a greater diversity of, or of organisms, of animals within each of the phyla, which is the reason why the um, Cambrian fossil beds, um, and there are three major Cambrian fossil beds that cover this time period, show a huge diversity, diversification of organisms and many, many new shapes, weird and wonderful, emerging in response to both the rapid diversification and the appearance of um, new behaviors amongst organisms, particularly the animals. We see the rise and increase in predation and significant increase in predation. The next major step is the appearance of vertebrates. Um, these would appear uh, roughly 470, 480 million years ago um, in the form of fish or early, early fish. And throughout the Devonian, we see the diversification of fish. So these are the first vertebrates that we recognize. Then around 470 million years ago, we start to see the first evidence of plants starting to colonize um, dry ground, starting to colonize the land, along with, fu with fungi. And in fact, there is a hypothesis out there that suggests that the very early plants to colonize dry ground may not have been able to do that unless they were accompanied by symbiotic fungi. And we see this reinforced by the fact that about 95% of the modern plant kingdom has some symbiotic relationship with fungi. Um, in many cases, to the benefit of the plant, in some cases, to the benefit of both organisms. But this is a very, very ancient relationship. And it possibly is the main reason why we have plants on dry land today because fungi accompanied them as symbionts and provided support to the very early plants that allowed them to actually survive on dry land and start to adapt to dry land um, and become the diverse group of organisms that we recognize today. And when we do the two plant chapters um, later in the semester, we'll talk more about that. So once you have plants established on dry land, now you have a source of food which would attract animals. Now, some animals had already been venturing onto dry land in the form of early arthropods because the arthropod body plan um, with an external skeleton, the exoskeleton and jointed legs that allows them to both walk and support themselves out of the water allowed them to at least begin exploring dry land. But in the absence of a food resource, they would always apparently return back to the water again, but at least they made excursions onto dry land for various reasons um, that we don't fully understand, but people have um, proposed some ideas as to why they may have done that. But the ancestors of um, modern arthropods or terrestrial arthropods and particularly insects make the journey onto dry ground after plants colonize the, the um, dry ground to, us, to provide a food source. And so for about a hundred million years, um, arthropods and particularly insects are the only animals on dry land, utilizing all of the habitats and all of the environments. And this is the reason why of all of the animal kingdom, 
Um, arthropods are the most diverse and within arthropods, insects are the most diverse of the arthropods. There are more insects, a species of insects than there are of all other animal species combined on dry ground. There's a huge diversity of insects. And the reason why is because for 100 million years, they had no competition. But then around 380 to 370 million years ago, we start to see the first forays of vertebrates onto dry land. And these are the ancestors of amphibians. And they already have the precursors of limbs. In fact, they have limbs that would provide them with a limited amount of mobility on dry land, because it turns out that limbs as we know them evolve initially in water, not on dry ground. It's only secondarily they become useful for supporting um, body weight in the absence of water under the force of gravity on dry ground. And the first um, early amphibians and, ancest and, and ancest ancestors of amphibians make their first forays onto dry ground around 375 million years, 380 to 370 million years ago in that time frame. Um, during this period, um, plate tectonics is moving the continental land masses around and they're slowly starting to drift together. And while amphibians start to dominate um, the land, um, the land is also starting to change as the continental land masses come together. It's starting to dry out. The weather patterns are changing because the ocean currents around this large mass of land are starting to change. And this starts to favor organisms that are better adapted to dry land and particularly don't have a requirement to return to water for reproductive purposes. And so we start to see the emergence of a group of animals that have some mammalian characteristics and some reptile characteristics. And these are going to be the precursors of the two big branches or the two big branches or, or two branches of terrestrial tetrapods that we recognize today. The reptiles, which includes the birds and the mammals. Those are the two big branches of terrestrial tetrapods. And the ancestors of both of these um, branches of terrestrial tetrapods are emerging in, during this time frame, and they dominate a time period called the Permian, which is when the continental land masses finally come together to form the large continent, single continent called Pangaea. And they um, dominate this land mass. Um, they are primarily herbivores, but you also see um, a range of carnivores as well. Uh, these, many of these are described as being hairy reptiles, reflecting the fact that they have both mammalian and reptilian characteristics. You can see a picture here of one that is um, a little bit further on in the um, evolution of mammals. It belongs to um, a very, very early group of ancestors to mammals that first emerge from a common ancestor to mammals and reptiles. And this is called Dimetrodon. A lot of people think that it is actually a dinosaur. It's not, it's not reptilian at all. It's much, much closer to mammals. And it's actually on the branch that would ultimately lead to mammals. Um, and it was present right at the end of the Permian. It did not survive, however, the end Permian extinction which occurred um, as the large continental land masses, Pangaea, started to break up again. And as it broke up, the fracture plates between the tectonic plates started to show increased volcanism. And in a region that now is found in Siberia, a large crack opened up and gave rise to a massive volcanic eruption called the flood basalt eruption. This eruption did not last for a few days. It lasted for nearly a million years, and it covered um, a large portion of Southeast Asia and, and, and um, Siberia in many thousands of feet of lava over the course of that 
million years. Now, of course, it also spewed out a lot of volcanic gas, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, global warming gases. And this raised the temperature um, overall to uh, um, about 10 degrees above where it had been. So it was a 10 degree um, increase in global temperature. And this mass extinction um, wiped out somewhere around 95 to 96% of all known species. Just let that sink in for a minute. Somewhere around 95 to 96% of all known species went extinct at this point, including many of these hairy reptiles. But fortunately, some of them survived this extinction and would shortly after split into the two branches called diapsids, which would lead to all the reptiles, including dinosaurs and birds, and synapsids, which would ultimately give rise to mammals. Now, it turns out that for reasons which we don't fully understand, one group of reptiles towards the middle and late Triassic, the Triassic being the, the era that immediately follows the Permian, would start to get an advantage. And these would be the dinosaurs. They were really small when they first emerged, around the size of chickens. But on into the Jurassic, mid-Jurassic, late Jurassic, and particularly on into Cretaceous, these would become the dominant organisms on the planet and would dominate the landscape for about 170 million years. At the same time, two other groups of reptiles that would not dominate as significantly as dinosaurs on dry land, but would dominate their own habitats um, in the pterosaurs dominating the air and the ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs and mosasaurs, which would dominate the oceans. And they would be the dominant um, life forms um, in their particular habitats in parallel with the dinosaurs. Mammals were present throughout this whole time, but no mammal got larger than perhaps a large house cat, because if you got any bigger than that, you attracted the attention of the dinosaurs. And so mammals throughout the, the reign of the dinosaurs were small, they were nocturnal, um, they lived in burrows largely. Some of them actually preyed on dinosaur eggs, on dinosaur nests. We have evidence um, from the Cretaceous of a large cat-like mammal that actually raided um, T-Rex nests and stole eggs out of T-Rex nests. Um, so there's a lot of interesting things that we know, but of course, everyone knows that around 65 million years ago, something happened that drove the dinosaurs, the pterosaurs um, and the plesiosaurs ichthyosaurs and mosasaurs to extinction, along with around 70% of all other species. Except that not all dinosaurs disappeared. So we have to reframe what we say now when we talk about the extinction of the dinosaurs. We have to be very careful and we have to say the non-avian or the non-bird dinosaurs, because yes, dinosaurs are still with us. We call them birds. And there is a significant body of evidence now that clearly indicates not only are dinosaurs birds, but dinosaurs, at least the large meat-eating dinosaurs and the, the lineage of um, dinosaurs that birds emerge from, um, the, the Saurician dinosaurs, probably all had feathers. Now, these are not flight feathers. These are feathers that look a little bit more like hairs or the um, body covering feathers, the downy feathers that birds use to keep their bodies warm. And that's probably where feathers first emerge as a way of keeping the body of the dinosaurs warm. But in one line of dinosaurs, um, and this includes um, T-Rex and the um, smaller meat-eating dinosaurs, that form this lineage, um, some of those feathers would take on different roles. And in one small branch, those feathers would take on an asymmetric form and become flight feathers. And you would have first 
feathered flying lizards. Archaeopteryx is a really good example of that. Um, but then eventually, um, through adaptation to flight, um, you would see the emergence of three lines of birds that would um, exist throughout the late, Crete late Jurassic and through the Cretaceous. Two of those lines of birds would become extinct along with the rest of the dinosaurs and one lineage of birds would survive the extinction, possibly because they were associated with bodies of water, particularly lakes and rivers that would allow them to survive and they would form the basis of the birds that we see around us today. And in fact, some birds shortly after the extinction event, as life struggled to reestablish itself for around 10 billion years, sorry, 10, 10 million years, not 10 billion years, would actually be the dominant predators. We call these terror birds. They stood 10 to 15 feet tall. They had heads the size of a soccer ball or bigger than that. Um, and they were major predators, but they were flightless. And that was to lead to their downfall eventually. Um, once mammals started to diversify and started to occupy all the vacant niches that had once been occupied by dinosaurs, they also started to see these terror birds as a source of food, um, particularly the nests and having no other way of breeding other than breeding on the ground because you're flightless, um, they were driven to extinction as the, as the mammals radiated to occupy all the niches around the world that had previously been vacated by the dinosaurs. Some large flightless birds would hold out um, that were very um, closely related to the terror birds. These would be the mowers of New Zealand, but even they, could not survive the appearance of early man in the form of the Maoris around um, 1000 AD um, when the Maoris first arrived in New Zealand. And once the Maoris arrived in New, in New Zealand, the Moas went extinct within 100 years due to um, hunting. Uh, but we now live in the age of mammals, uh, as with mammals as the dominant um, animals, at least on dry land, and to some degree in the oceans, because um, whales are mammals uh, descended from terrestrial tetrapod ancestors. Um, about 50 million years ago is when we start to see the ancestors, the early terrestrial ancestors of whales starting to venture back into the water again and starting to adapt to a life that is fully aquatic. So that gives you a, a, an overview of the history of life as we know it from the fossil record. And I'm not going to talk about dating fossils. Um, we've talked about that and you've done calculations on that in the um, paleontology lab. Uh, so there's no need to really go into a big discussion on dating. You understand the concept, I hope, of half-lives. Um, we also have um, evidence of tectonic activity from the magnetic um, particles in rocks. Um, mag whenever rock is liquid, magnetic particles are free to align to the um, mag Earth's magnetic field. Once the rock solidifies, those mag magnetic particles are locked in their orientation. Um, and what we do know is that the Earth's magnetic field um, flips. North becomes south, south becomes north, and does so on a regular basis. Um, every a um, few hundred thousand years appears, appears to be the situation based on the record left in the rock. So that gives us some ideas about the movement of tectonic plates as well and the rate at which things are moving. And so we have all sorts of records about ecological and geological changes that have affected the earth and therefore will have had effects on the trajectory of evolution. Um, which we see reflected in the fossil record. Um, yeah, I sh yeah, I should probably talk about this diagram because we've kind of touched on this. Um, and so I should probably um, 
talk a little bit about this because this is going to become significant later in the semester again. So I mentioned that there are two major branches that come from those hairy reptiles, um, the gorgonopsids and other um, animals that dominated the Permian, a few of which made it through the Permian extinction and became the ancestors to reptiles in the form of the diapsids. So let me um, make a note here. So this is the diapsid branch. Oops. So this is the diapsid branch. Which is the other big branch that comes out of this common ancestor. And then you have the synapsids. Um, synapsids would then diversify into therapsids. Um, and what we see when we look at the synapsid and the therapsid skull, and these are examples of two fossils that we have of synapses and, thera and um, therapsids, is that they have a very reptilian skull. And the feature that tell, or the two features that tell us that is the presence of this structure called the temporal fenestra. That is something that is only found in reptile skulls, in modern rep reptiles, and also in fossil reptiles. This is a hollow space behind the eye socket or the orbital. This is the eye socket here, and it serves to lighten the skull. The other thing that tells us it's very reptilian is the fact that the lower jaw is made up of multiple bones. So here is what will eventually become the lower jaw in mammals as the bone elongates and displaces these other two bones. But then you've also got a set of bones here that form the joint between the lower jaw and the upper jaws, which is very reptilian. And this is what it is this um, type of joint that actually allows snakes to disengage their lower jaw from their upper jaw and open their mouth much wider than you would expect and swallow items that are much larger than their head because they can um, disengage the jaw joint. The, joint. the two jaws are then held together only by ligaments and this allows them to open their mouth up. And you can see here in the therapsid, you've still got the temporal fenestra, the joint between the upper and lower jaw is still formed by these two small bones, um, which are called the quadrate and yeah, it's up here, so I might as well look, the quadrate and the articula. They will eventually become small bones in your inner ear for mammals. Um, if there's another story in that. Notice that the lower jaw is now changing. It, instead of being made up of three bones, it's now made up of two bones, and this bone is actually elongating. What you should also notice is that in this skull, as far as dentition is concerned, there are only, there's only one type of teeth. You know that mammals have incisors and canines and premolars and molars. Reptiles only have, either have peg-like teeth if they're carnivores or grinding flat teeth if they're herbivores. So there's no um, diversity of dentition, no diversity of teeth in the jaw with very reptilian characteristic. And you see that in the synapsids. In the therapsids, you start to see a little bit of a change. So here is a tooth that looks very much like a canine, very elongated tooth. But notice that the teeth are still very peg-like. There's not a whole lot of diversity, although you see an in in indication of perhaps something that looks like incisors there. But still, the teeth, there's no great differential as far as the teeth are concerned. That you start to see occurring more in the cynodonts, which are the immediate um, ancestors to mammals. Again, this bone is elongating even further. The temporal fenestra has essentially disappeared. In mammals, it is not present at all. Um, the lower jaw is still uh, made up of multiple bones. The jaw joint is still made up of the articular and the quadrate bones. So it's still a very reptilian-like jaw. But as you see the ongoing evolution of the cynodonts, the lower jaw eventually um, is made up of this single bone. The jaw joint 
is a hinge joint between this bone. Um, let me bring that the pen back into play again. Between this, what is now the lower jaw bone and the upper jaw. So the quadrate and the, the articulate are no longer the hinge. They are supporting bones adjacent to the hinge, but they no longer form the hinge. In very late cynodonts, um, all you see is the lower jaw bone, the quadrate and the articulate have now moved from the hinge. They've actually moved inside the skull and they eventually migrate up into the inner ear and become two of the three little bones that link your eardrum to the cochlea and allow for much higher vibrations of the eardrum to occur to allow you to hear high-pitched sounds that reptiles can't even begin to hear because they only have a single bone. So those, the two bones from the hinge move inwards to join the existing bone that all reptiles possess to create a three bone connection with two joints that allows for a lot of motion, increased vibration, and you hear high pitched sounds that reptiles can't hear. All of this takes place as the skull evolves over time. And notice here with the, the um, mid to late cynodonts, you have an increase in diversification of dentition. You now have clear incisors, canines, and a series of teeth that you might describe as molars. Um, and then in a late cynodont, clear canines, clear incisors, clear molars. Very mammalian jaw structure, very main mammalian dentition. And again, you can see this gradual change in the skull structure as you move from synapsid type skull through serapsids. So very reptilian, somewhat reptilian, quasi-reptilian, quasi-mammal, um, more mammal, very mammal. A, a, a sequential increase in a change in skull structure and dentition from reptilian-like to mammalian-like. Um, not going to go into the geological record very much um, by virtue of the fact that this is something that you've already been introduced to. You should be learning this. Remember um, in the paleontology lab, there was a listing of the time periods that you're responsible to know. Um, that is taken directly from this diagram. So please make sure that you know those time periods. You need to know them for them but I'm not really expect you to know what each would be to have someone occurring in the bridge. Um, I'm not sure what's happening. Uh, uh, let me just shrink that back again so we can continue on. I think uh, something happened as far as concerned. I'll just let it ride right now. So I want to continue. I want to finish this. Um, so way that has been popularly used to diagram the history of life on Earth and the time periods. Um, that are involved is to use a 24 hour clock. And so here you can get a 24 hour clock um, diagram showing the time periods and the major um, time periods that you should be aware of and the sort of events that took place in each of them. We're going to touch on a few of them. So we're going to talk about the um, June event. We're going to talk about the rise of eukaryotes from prokaryotes. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about colonization of land, but I've already discussed a lot about the, the story of life on, on Earth when we looked at the, the fossil record. So I don't want to get too repetitive and um, 
expand this recording any more than it needs to be. So we're going to touch on some of the points that, that are highlighted here on this diagram over the course of the next number of slides. But before we do that, um, let's take a break again. Here is the concept check question for this break. Remember, when I return from the break, when you return from the break, we'll discuss the um, answer to this question. So you find a fossilized skull that has a carbon 14 to carbon 12 ratio of about 1 16th that of modern day skulls. Approximately how many years old is the fossilized skull? This should be a calculation that you should be able to perform because you've already done some in the paleontology lab. But I'll see you on the other side of the break with the answer to this question. <laughs> 